All right, welcome everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome to the State Water Board's public meeting on the preliminary proposed updates to the drought emergency regulation for the Scott River and Shasta River watersheds. My name is Molly Williams. I'm an environmental scientist with the State Water Board's Office of Public Participation, and I will be facilitating our meeting today. This is the second meeting that we've held on the topic of proposed readoption of the drought emergency regulation, and it was publicly noticed on May 17th. This is an informal public meeting where a quorum of State Water Board members may be present, but the State Water Board itself will not take a formal action. Okay, before we get started, we'll go over a couple meeting logistics. Uh, so this meeting is being recorded as you were informed when you joined, um, and we will go ahead and post on the Scott Shasta Drought website as soon as possible when the meeting ends. Uh, take a moment to make sure that um, your screen name, if you can see it, reflects your first and last name, especially if you're providing a comment. We'll also have time for questions and comments after staff presentations. Um, and at that time, you'll be able to provide comments verbally or ask questions. You can also use the chat feature to speak directly to hosts and panelists, um, and that won't be able to be seen by other people in the meeting. And we'll also be accepting email comments until May 31st. And a little bit later after the presentations, we'll go over in detail how to participate in the Zoom meeting today. All right, and just as a reminder, we're going over some ground rules here because what we're discussing today is important. And we do recognize how personal and at times emotional the subject can be. And we wanna create a space where everyone can share their input on the topic respectfully and be heard and respected in return. Um, so to help us accomplish this, we have some ground rules for the meeting. Number one, uh, this is a public discussion, right? Not a debate. And the purpose is not to win an argument, but to hear and respect the perspectives and ideas that are shared today. Uh, we ask also that you listen actively and with an open mind. And with this, we can better understand each other's perspectives when we try to see things from their point of view. And you can respect another person's point of view without agreeing with them. We also want to remind everyone to please stay on point and on time. Uh, we have limited time together today. We wanna to make sure that everyone who wants to speak or ask a question is able to be heard. So please keep your comments brief and to the point so that everyone who wants to speak can do so. And we also highly encourage specific comments that will help inform updates to our draft regulation. So make sure to keep on topic here. Um, in addition to the changes, we would also like to hear what elements of the regulation you would like to ensure are kept. All right, so our meeting agenda for today pretty straightforward. Um, our purpose for this meeting, again, is to receive comments on the draft updates to the regulation. And if you have questions, you can email us at scottshastadrought at waterboards.ca.gov. Um, so the first presentation we're going to hear is from Anne-Marie Orr with the State Water Board Division of Water Rights, uh, who will talk about proposed updates to the drought emergency regulation. We'll then hear about um, We'll hear from Joe Croteau from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And after that, we will open the floor to questions um, for a brief period, followed by public comments, and we will adjourn by 4 p.m. All right, and with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Anne-Marie Orr. Thank you, Molly. Um, I don't know that we're on the right slide though. Can we go up? There we go. So good afternoon. My name is Anne-Marie Orr and I'm the program manager for the water quality certification and public trust section at the State Water Resources Control Board. Our main purpose for holding this meeting is to get your feedback on the draft proposed changes to the drought emergency regulation for the Scott and Shasta River watersheds. We will begin the meeting by discussing ongoing drought conditions, and then we'll provide an overview of the proposed updates to the regulation and related timelines. Next, we'll hear a presentation from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife before we transition to a question session that will then be followed by a comment session. 
Next slide, please. This graphic of the U.S. Drought Monitor shows that as of May 17th of this year, most, uh, exactly 95% of Siskiyou County, which is shown by the black pin in the center of this map, is in extreme drought. This is one of the driest years on record in Siskiyou County. Next slide. This slide compares the snow water content measured in inches at Middle Boulder 3, represented by blue lines, and Scott Mountain Station's orange lines. This graphic compares current measurements, the solid lines down at the bottom, to historic average levels. The blue dashed line is the averaged snow water content for Middle Boulder 3, and the orange dashed line is the averaged data for Scott Mountain. In the Scott River watershed, snow conditions are less than 10% of average for the state. Next slide. This slide provides a visual of the snow water equivalent in the region, comparing May 24th of this year, the figure on the left, to May 24th of 2019, which was a wet year, which is the figure on the right. As you can see from the figure on the left, Snowpack in both the Scott River and Shasta River watersheds is very low this year. Next slide. On May 18th, board staff released a draft of the proposed changes to the drought emergency regulation for the Scott and Shasta River watersheds. This slide and the next slide list all of the major sections of the regulation and show in bold which sections contain proposed changes that are beyond simple clarifications. From this slide, I'll be discussing the two sections shown in bold, which include the proposed changes to the emergency flow requirements and the minimum human health and safety sections. Next slide, please. As shown here, I will be discussing proposed changes to three sections shown in bold, including priority for curtailment, curtailment order reporting, and inefficient livestock watering. Next slide. The next few slides will provide an overview to the proposed changes to section 875 in the regulation. Specifically, I will discuss proposed language to the regulation to provide continuity of the regulation. I will also discuss proposed changes to the drought minimum flows and local cooperative solution sections. Next slide, please. Within section 875 of the regulation, we're proposing changes to maintain continuity for existing curtailment orders and approved certifications and petitions. The proposed changes will keep approved local cooperative solutions in effect for the time period that was approved within each local cooperative solution agreement. The proposed changes will also apply the new flow requirements, which I will discuss next, or apply to the new flow requirements. Um, this will keep the existing curtailment orders in effect, so they don't need to be reissued. Next slide. This slide shows the proposed changes to the existing Scott River flow requirements in bold faced type. The only proposed change is to ramp down the flow during the last week of June, such that the river doesn't drop from 125 CFS to 50 CFS all at once. So for the last week of June, the proposed flow requirement is 90 CFS. Next slide. Here are the proposed changes to the Shasta flow requirements. Based on the recommendation from CDFW, we're proposing to lower the flows in January, February, March, October, November, and December. Additionally, in the last week of March and the last two weeks of September, we're proposing to change the flows such that they are ramped. Um, they'll be ramping downward in the last week of March and upward in the last two weeks of September. Similar to the ramping changes in the Scott River watershed, this is intended to facilitate a more gradual transition in river flows. 
Next slide. This slide provides additional information on proposed changes to local cooperative solutions language within the regulation. As mentioned in an earlier slide, under the proposed regulation update, existing local cooperative solutions will remain in effect for the duration specified in each individual local cooperative solution plan. For the local cooperative solutions for groundwater, the proposed update also changes the 400 acre minimum requirement from an individual requirement to a watershed wide requirement, which has the effect of relaxing that condition requirement. We've added in that percent reduction to water use can be based on a comparison to water use in the 2020, 2021, or 2022 irrigation seasons. And we've also added um, Siskiyou County and the Shasta Valley Resource Conservation District as potential coordinating entities. And we've also uh, clarified that the definition of a coordinating entity is not an individual and relevant experience is required. Next slide. The proposed regulation updates allow livestock diversions to submit local cooperative solution plans to provide additional flexibility. If CDFW finds the proposal will adequately protect fishery resources and the board finds sufficient water is available for competing uses. Um, and, and these include storage for human health and safety and environmental needs. Um, we need to have a finding that it will not result in additional curtailments and that the minimum flows will be met. This type of livestock local cooperative solution must include monitoring to ensure fishery resources are not adversely impacted. Next slide, please. Within the proposed regulation updates, we've expanded the minimum health and safety definition to include non-commercial vegetable gardens and domestic animal watering. And consistent with updates to other drought emergency regulations, we added a definition for urban water suppliers. Urban water suppliers, as defined in Water Code Section 10617, need to follow the strictest stage of that supplier's adopted water shortage contingency plan. Next slide. We've added a provision that allows the State Water Board to exclude from curtailment small domestic groundwater diversions of less than two acre feet per year and is used for human health and safety. This is consistent with the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act definition of de minimis groundwater use. Next slide. Proposed changes within section 875.6 will remove the requirement to file curtailment certification forms when ceasing a diversion because of a curtailment order. However, the requirement to file for a curtailment exception remains if you need to continue diverting for human health and safety, livestock, or non-consumptive uses after receiving a curtailment order. Next slide. Staff are proposing to extend the prohibition on inefficient livestock watering until March 31st. In the existing regulation, it runs through January 31st. It would maintain the option to lift the prohibition early with a recommendation from CDFW that there would be no impacts to fish and a finding that lifting the prohibition will not result in issuance of curtailments. You may remember that the prohibition was lifted earlier in the Shasta River watershed than was dictated by the existing regulation because it was lifted on January 21st. In the Scott River watershed this year, flows dropped below the flow requirement for several days in early February, shortly after the prohibition expired on January 31st. Extending the inefficient livestock watering provision will help address flow drops during this important time of year for salmon and steelhead. Next slide, please. 
Groundwater recharge continues to be of interest to landowners. It can provide a means of storing water underground that can be used later in the year for beneficial uses, for example, irrigated agriculture. However, it is not a beneficial use for water rights in and of itself. The newly proposed local cooperative solutions may provide an opportunity for groundwater storage projects. We wanted to highlight the fact that the board has the ability to issue temporary groundwater storage permits as 180 day or five year permits. Temporary permits are attractive because they can usually be processed more quickly than standard permits and they may be renewed. Temporary groundwater storage permits have been used in the Scott River watershed in the past. Earlier this spring, the board issued a 180 day temporary groundwater storage permit to the Scott Valley Irrigation District. The board has dramatically discounted the 180 day temporary permit, permit application fee for underground storage permits. And the five-year permit option, which is for Sigma related underground storage projects, is a new permitting option as of 2020 and has similarly low fees. Further, CEQA fees for groundwater storage projects are suspended. A great deal of information can be found on the Water Rights Groundwater Recharge website, including the difference between temporary and standard permit processes for groundwater storage projects. The website address is provided here, but it's also on our final how to stay informed slide at the end of the presentation. Last but not least, I wanna note that although temp the temporary permit process is expedited, people still need to get their applications in timely Application should be submitted this summer if you want to have a temporary permit by this fall or winter. These, um, our anticipated next steps include reviewing feedback from this meeting and any comments received by May 31st. And I wanna note that we'll be posting a notice of extension of the comment period later today. It was formally May 27th. But as I mentioned, we have pushed it back to May 31st in response to some requests. Um, then staff will develop the final proposed regulation and supporting digest materials for release with the notice of proposed rulemaking no later than June 10th. Once the notice of proposed rulemaking is released, there will be an additional comment period. Staff plan to bring the regulation package before the State Water Board to consider adoption at the June 21st board meeting. If the regulation is adopted by the board, then it gets submitted to the Office of Administrative Law for final approval. And while I cannot tell you the exact time frame for this final approval process, if things go smoothly and similar to last year, we could expect the regulation to become effective about two weeks after it's submitted to OAL. And now, um, well, next slide. Um, here's some detailed information regarding how to access the Water Board's Drought Emergency Regulation website, as well as how to sign up for our email subscription list. And while you review this, which will also be, be posted with the presentation, for your reference later, I'll transition the presentation to Joe Cruteau. Thank you. Anne Marie or Molly, can you hear and see me okay? Yes, I can. Loud and clear. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, so, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Joe Cruteau. Uh, we first want to thank the State Water Board for accepting and considering our request to readopt the drought emergency regulation on the, on the Scott and Shasta Rivers <clears throat> and for fitting us into this workshop and presentation. We also want to thank staff from the State Water Board, tribal council and members, elected officials, and many of those in the ranching community and other private citizens that have taken the time to offer ideas, suggestions, support, and thank those that have expressed concerns or frustration about the regulation. I am a program manager with California Department of Fish and Wildlife and have primary responsibilities for restoration, environmental permitting and drought response and juvenile salmon monitoring in Siskiyou County. 
On April 20th, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife transmitted a letter to the State Water Resources Control Board requesting readoption of the drought emergency regulation for an additional 12 months. In that letter, we recommended retaining some existing regulations and adding or modifying others. What follows is a very brief outline and overview th of things to consider. And we look forward to your feedback today. Grateful for everybody who's joining us. Next slide, please. So this outline is just a quick summary of the five main talking points we'll cover in this presentation. We'll be spending a little time talking about funding opportunities, hopefully to generate ideas on how to get money, more money flowing into the community. We realize there's some challenges there and we wanna um, inspire our conversation. We'll talk briefly uh, about the regulation flexibility we're trying to achieve. The intent is to balance regulatory and voluntary efforts and rely on all who live in and around the, the salmon in this community to make contributions. We'll quickly cover the migration information that we went through on May 4th, kind of um, re, re, uh, do that one section. Uh, we'll show you visually what a bad year can look like for salmon, on the, um, particularly on the Scott River. And we'll end with a review of what is on our minds when we talk about bare minimum flows. So I covered this topic last year and I just wanna end with that so it gives some context for why um, we're doing what we do. Next slide, please. So we really want to um, acknowledge um, that there has been quite a bit of flexibility bit, uh, built into the regulation. The State Water Board staff went to great lengths to include the flexibility and specifically with modifications for readoption uh, of particular um, importance and utilization in the regulation was resolution number six. Uh, so far, that resolution has supported us making an adjustment to the um, December flows on the Shasta River in last December. Uh, we used, uh, um, made, used information provided to us to make a ramp down adjustment in March of this year. Um, pending how things go um, and consistent with the current proposal, we have a, um, we'd like to propose a, a ramp down flow in June to minimize um, an overnight um, you know, potential juvenile fish ki um, killing event. And then we recommended adjustments in our April 20th letter um, that were in the spirit of resol uh, resolution number six. So um, uh, we're grateful and you know, I can't imagine this resolution going away. I just wanna show you that kind of flexibility was built in. And then um, green bullet there, the ability to modify inefficient stock water prohibition and recovered it a little bit. Um, the modified regulation includes the ability to consider creative solutions to inefficient livestock watering instead of a complete prohibition. It is outlined on page six of the draft regulation and allows a more expedient adjustment if a plan is developed in coordination with CDFW. And then I, I, uh, we, uh, Amory covered this too, local cooperative solutions have been executed, um, quite a few on the Scott River side. Um, they demonstrate each ranch is a little different with different needs and different histories. We have several more in the queue and look forward to working on them as they come in for review. Next slide, please. So uh, as I stated, I was gonna go, re, uh, go over some of the drought funding opportunities um, that are available to the community and that were presented by our staff on March 18th of this year. Um, as you can see, the primary funding source uh, uh, was discussed in Senate Bill 170. There are four sections in Senate Bill 170 um, we're gonna highlight today real quickly. There's sections 51, 53, 54, and 80. These funds are available directly from the agencies receive the allotments and each agency has their own application process that you'll want to get familiar with prior to applying. Uh, in addition to the opportunities in Senate Bill 170, we covered a regional funding opportunity opportunity and a couple other uh, formal grants found on the state and federal government's grant websites. So real quickly, we'll just review the four sections under Senate Bill 170. As I stated earlier, the process of securing funding dollars is unfamiliar and potentially time prohibitive for some folks. It may be that we have to generate more discussion with nonprofits or grant savvy in individuals who help uh, entities apply for these dollars. And uh, the purpose of this part of the presentation is to try to get people thinking about how to do that. Next slide, please. 
So uh, this is a summary of Section 51 under Senate Bill 170, provides money to the Department of Fish and Wildlife for a variety of, purpose, variety of purposes. About 5 million is currently available from the Biodiversity Conservation Program to purchase water from willing sellers, protect in-stream flows, build water conservation projects, implement emergency restoration activities, and carry out conservation strategies that are identified in the State Wildlife Action Plan. Um, these funds need to be applied for and encumbered by uh, June 30th of next year, 2023. So there's, there's time to figure this, this funding source out for folks. Um, the contact person at the Department of Fish and Wildlife for these funds is Bob Hawkins. He's, uh, his email is here. And uh, just a reminder that this presentation for March 18th is on the State Water Board website. Um, Generally, this funding source starts with a one-page summary proposal with estimated costs to Bob Hawkins. So we've tried to make this as simple as possible. And the easiest thing to do is reach out to Bob and he'll walk you through those steps. Next slide, please. Uh, section 53 dedicates 31 million to the Wildlife Conservation Fund for the protection of fish and wildlife resources in response to climate change and the habitat needs for fish and wildlife. Some major programs include the California Riparian Habitat Conservation Program, the Ecosystem Restoration on Agricultural Lands Program, and the Habitat Enhancement and Restoration Program. Eligible purposes include all the items you see on the right are highlighted in green projects that protect threatened endangered species. That's a pretty broad category. And um, there's uh, if you contact Shannon Lucas, who's the contact here, um, she can walk you through a potential project if you have an idea in mind, and we can do that with the Department of Fish and Wildlife too. So again, we'll make these available and please consider some of these things available from section 53. Next slide, please. Section 54 has 100 million available uh, allocated funds for wildlife conservation fund. The primary purpose of this funding is to enhance in-stream flow to protect fish and wildlife. Again, we've got a list of eligible uses for these funds, including acquisition of water rights, acquisition of land that includes water rights, projects that provide water for fish and wildlife, and projects that improve aquatic or riparian habitat conditions. It sounds like a lot of good stuff in there. Um, we have, again, Shannon Lucas is a contact for this. And uh, we have until June 30th of 2024 to encumber portions or all of this $100 million. So let's uh, think of in this community about how we can do that. Uh, next slide, please. The last section under Senate Bill 170 I was going to go over um, was uh, is under the uh, Section 80 for the Department of Water Resources. In there, you'll see that there's about $200 million available. Available um, projects, um, eligible projects include reliable water supply sources, improving water system storage, replacing aging water system infrastructure. A lot of ranchers have been doing that. And we'd like to encourage continue doing that because we've seen some benefits of that. Um, the, uh, we have until June 30th of 2024 to encumber those funds. Um, 200 million, a lot of money out there, everybody. Uh, make Somebody make a contact to the small community drought uh, email you see there and let's get some ideas going about how to use these, the, these dollars. So that's it for my funding slides. Um, please, uh, let's, let, we'll move on uh, to the next slide. So um, this is just a cue for me to talk and uh, kind of rehash the um, slides I went over from May 4th, reviewing some salmon migration information we covered. I reversed the order a little bit just for uh, flow of my presentation. Next slide. Here's our figure for Shasta River uh, juvenile salmon. The light blue fill represents the historical range and timing that, um, of the, of the uh, adult, uh, juvenile migration. The dashed lines represent the historical mean and medians. As shown in the Shasta River, um, let's see, I have a note here that's out of line, but anyways, we, uh, the coho one plus out migration is currently around 2,300 fish. Uh, estimated Chinook zero plus out migration is approximately 1.4 million. These numbers indicate that we're likely to see more of the same sorts of adult returns for both species in the coming years. Um, but uh, that's, you know, that's just uh, based on past, um, who knows what the future holds. Next slide, please. 
these are the adult number of Shasta uh, for Shasta River for both species. Um, this last year, the Shasta River coho return was uh, 53. Hopefully, it's not too small for you to see. This brood year, uh, highlighted in red, had a return of 39. So we we track the co the, the coho salmon more as brood years or, or um, cohorts, and so the co that's color coded to help track those brood years. Um, something that I you know want to note here is that we uh, last year uh, presented the concept of an extinction vortex, where small populations are are subject to poor genetic diversity and one bad year away from being functionally extinct. These numbers on the coho for coho on the Shasta River are extremely low. Um, you'll see even 2009, we had, uh, it looked like we had nine come in. I would say that we're flirt flirting with a coho salmon brood year extinction in the Shasta River if we don't take care of them. And um, uh, we um, don't want obviously that to happen. So we're, we're really trying to take care of those fish. The lower figure displays Shasta River numbers for adult Chinook. Um, we refer to them as, as uh, as returns since they tend to um, return at in, uh, different intervals. Um, this year, so far, we've seen about 6,900 uh, um, uh, Chinook. Um, and uh, this last year, the return was slightly above average and better than the previous two years. You can see that we have longer term, lower than average returns uh, with this recent positive trend between 2011 and 2018. So there were some, there's been some good years in the not so far distant past. Um, we're still running a little bit below average the last couple of few years. Next slide, please. Moving over to the Scott River, um, the top figure represents the most recent juvenile coho salmon out migration in the Scott River. The black line represents this year's 2022 one plus juvenile out migration. Estimated uh, coho one plus out migration is, is, is almost 57,000. Uh, the 2022 juvenile estimates look promising. In fact, they look really good. They're likely going to plateau somewhere between the mean and historical maximum, but um, we're, we're trending right under the historical maximum right now. It's important to think about this um, out migration. This is a reproduction from the 2020 cohort that was not able to navigate to spawning habitat until very late in the migration season um, of that year. And then uh, on the bottom, this year's juvenile Chinook salmon appear to be on track to be at or um, slightly above historical average. Uh, out migration right now is about 326,000. Um, precipitation events in October and December with subsequent snow melt appear to have partially mitigated the long dry spell this late winter and spring. Uh, let's see, next slide, please. Uh, the top figure here is uh, for coho salmon on the Scott River. Um, the coho right uh, for that came in this last fall, the number there, if you can't see it, is 947. The same cohort from 2018 in red was uh, 727. Uh, we've color coded the cohorts to show you the last five generations. Uh, the, the cohorts displayed by the blue and red lines have been steadily increasing. And it looks like the black uh, barred coho uh, cohort might also be too. Credit needs to be given to all those in and around the community that have made recovery of the species a commitment through restoration and efficiency actions. The cohort displayed by the black demonstrates that the Scott River has a capacity to support even larger numbers of adult spawning coho. The reason we stated before and we're still saying we're concerned in drought years is also evident about what you see in the black cohort. Um, recall the drought years of 2014 and 15, you can see that we lost almost 90% of that brood year cohort uh, between 2013 and 2016. That cohort is not ma making a comeback, but you can see that without a, a drought response, we can set all the hard work back by several generations. The lower figures for Chinook salmon on the Scott River. Uh, right now, um, our adults this year return was th about 1,300 compared to 855 last year. Um, we've seen lower than average returns in the last seven years and 15 of the last 20 years. This is not a good trend for Chinook salmon. We hope that we can all agree that avoiding any kind of listing or um, any special action is a common goal for all of us. 
I place a little blue arrow by 2015 because in a couple of minutes I'll show you how low flows affect the adult migration on the Scott River. Um, we've had really low flow numbers, at least below average, since 2015 on the Scott River. Next slide, please. I showed this um, graph last year. It's a um, way to show how many of our adult Chinook salmon migrate above the weir and compare it to flows on the Fort Jones gauge in September. What we're noting here um, primarily is that these Chinook start showing up in September. And if we don't get them through by late October, most of them are not coming up through the weir and coming into the valley. They're either gonna um, not spawn, they'll spawn on top of each other, and we end up losing um, some early season spawning efforts probably, or the ones afterwards. There's some superimposition that can happen. But again, I wanna highlight here what happened in 2015. We only had 18% of our adults return above the weir, and you can see we were in single digits that whole time. Similar years were in 2018 and 2020. 2020 is what inspired us to pursue the drought regulation. Um, I, between uh, actions we took to um, in the regulation and Mother Nature's contributions, uh, we've had a, a good return in 2021. And again, uh, you can rely, uh, look pretty closely at that late October season and see what that means for our fish. Um, what we're attempting to do is with the regulation is not just hope it rains and right off the fish. If it doesn't happen, 2015 was a very brutal year for us. And that's the year since then we have not had uh, very good returns of, of Chinook. Getting closer to the end here. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to take us briefly back to 2015 as an example of when not enough water is flowing to support adult migration. The Fort Jones gauge is about 10 miles downstream of the town of Fort Jones at River Mile 23. The river flows downstream in this area. Uh, the river flows downstream from east to west here and then south to north. Our adult weir is, a, is at River Mile 18. Um, hopefully you can see it, that yellow peg there in the middle. There are several critical riffles starting about three quarters of a mile downstream of the weir in what we call Reach 6. The Kelsey Creek Bridge is just downstream of where Kelsey Creek, Kelsey Creek enters the Scott. I just want to note in summer of 2021, there were oversummering coho and steelhead in the main stem of the Scott River at the Kelsey Creek Bridge. 2015, an example when we were not seeing very many adult salmon passing through our weir. There were salmon we were desperately needed to need to successfully reproduce. So we, we started looking for them. We weren't finding them in the weir. We, had to, we went looking for them. And I'm going to show you about a 75, 75 second video with some captions that shows what happens in bad years. It shows the most resilient salmon. Um, I don't know. Did we lose the slide, Molly? I can bring it back one second. I'm not ready for the video yet. OK, sorry. Missed my cue. We didn't practice enough. <laughs> there we go. I'll, I'll let you know. Okay. So um, what the video is going to show is how are the most resilient salmon that we're trying to return to the natal streams. We've had below average total Chinook salmon return for the last seven years. The video will display what we've seen from the field and is why we are spending so much energy on emergency regulations with built-in flexibility. It may seem a little heavy, um, but we've had you know, some narratives out there that some of the things we're doing out there are either draconian or egregious or wild guesses, unnecessary or hollow. I would say if a picture is worth a thousand words then a short video is worth a few more. And so Molly, I would like to go ahead and just play this short video real quick. And then I have one more slide after that.
So um, that's just 75 seconds. We were watching that for weeks and a couple of months on the Scott River. And it's really hard for us to watch as a fish agency, which is why we're trying so hard to find some solutions here. Um, so I have one more slide, Molly, and then I'll turn it back over to you guys. I'll just end um, with something we introduced last year, which is what does bare minimum mean? Um, number one, we're trying to avoid the extinction vortex caused by poor genetics, minimizing catastrophic events, and maintaining life history diversity. Number two, we want to maintain sufficient stocks for sport, commercial, and tribal fisheries. And number three, we, acknowledging that for every uh, how much every CFS matters, increasing flows results in better access for habitat, mitigating temperature impacts, and necessary food production. So um, the one thing I didn't highlight here under avoiding the distinction vortex is I wanted to say that we really are trying to accommodate late and early spawners. It's not good enough just to accommodate early or late spawners for genetic diversity. So with that, um, I will uh, turn it back over, maybe last slide, just letting you know that I'm done with my part of the presentation, Molly. All right, thank you, Joe. So now that we have completed the two presentations that we were going to hear today, we're going to open it up to questions. And just as a reminder, we do have a comment period coming up, but we just wanted to give folks an opportunity um, if they have any lingering questions or points of clarification after hearing those presentations, and then we will get into public comment. So if you have a question, you can go ahead and raise your hand and I will invite you to unmute yourself. And I will um, just again, reiterate our ground rules here, right? Where this is a public discussion, not a debate. We'd like you to listen actively and with an open, open mind and um, please stay on point with your comments and questions. All right, so Marshall R, should get an invitation to unmute yourself. Yes, my question is for Joe Parteau. Uh, Joe, can you tell us why in 2013 there was a significant increase in coho salmon in Scott River 2500 plus? What, what accommodated that? I'm going to try to pull up the graph there. So um, what we've been um, letting people know uh, I don't know if we want to put the slide back up there, but we had, uh, that was our strongest uh, brood year or cohort, Richard. Um, you'll see that it, uh, in 2007, we had 1,600 fish. In 2010, we had, uh, I don't know, it says 917. So we had, that was our strongest brood. And we, we will, uh, would want to say, or we will say that the, the Scott River has a, a large capacity to grow coho salmon. Um, so there are things that are that the community is doing, Richard, that are, you know, there's a lot of restoration going into the, to the Scott. We had a couple of wet years leading into that. Um, that I th I, if I recall that 2013, 2014 were a couple of dry years in a row, but 2013 was coming off of a, of, it was a brood year that was, it was our strongest brood, if that makes sense. So Joe, I, I hear what you're saying. Uh, I don't think that really answered my question. You have a very specific increase in 2013. And I was really trying to figure out as a scientist what your uh, thinking is about why that happened. And also how does the PDO and the impact of the PDO interact with the coho salmon production? PDO. The Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which is credited by no, numerous scientists for the uh, ebb and flow of populations. Uh, that last part, Richard, I'd probably have to dig into a little bit and, and get back to you on that. We won't be able to do that today. But the reason that number is so high is that brood year um, was able to um, have a successful uh, out migration from the 2010. That brood year had a strong out migration. But doesn't it seem like an anomaly to you to see one year there that stands out, obviously, from all the rest of them? 
I think if I don't know about anomaly, it provides us hope that the coho that the, the Scott River has a high capacity to support fish. Now, recognizing your comment, but asking the question further, there should be a sorry, reason. I'm just gonna, sorry, I'm just going to jump in oh, real quick. So okay. <laughs> I apologize. Um, this is this is a very valid question, but today, for the purpose of this meeting, we want to focus the question specifically around the proposed updates to the regulation. So this is a very interesting scientific debate, and I'm sure we could take or uh, you know conversation. So. Um, if if you want to ask a question like this, please put it in the chat or feel free to email us at um, Scott Shasta Drought. So I'll put that email in the chat. Um, so, but we can we can reply to these questions in the chat or get to into email communication. But right now, um, we'd only like to hear questions that are specifically about the regulation. So sorry to interrupt there. Just want to make sure we're using our limited time to the best of our ability. And thank you for your question. Um, so let's go ahead and go to Nat Kane next. And please, um, if you would, uh, as soon as I invite you to unmute yourself, go ahead and introduce yourself and your affiliation if it's applicable. Hi, everyone. Um, this is Nat Kane with Environmental Law Foundation. Um, I have two questions, one for Mr. Cruteau and one for Ms. Orr. Um, for Mr. Cruteau, I thought that the video was extremely evocative. Um, and I was just wondering if you knew what the flow levels of the Fort Jones gauge were when um, that video was taken, just to sort of scale, um, you know, th those flows lower in the canyon with, with the numbers that we see out of the, out of the gauge. The flows uh, in 2015, all the way through the months from September through the end of November range between six and eight CFS. Oh. And then question for um, Ms. Orr, I believe, the um, revisions to section 875F4D4, which um, revised the baseline year for reductions um, in groundwater usage. I'm a little bit confused by how that provision is supposed to operate. Who is selecting the baseline year uh, and, and what criteria is used to select the baseline year? It was a little bit unclear to me from reading the regulation how that's supposed to work. And I, I was wondering if you could explain that a little bit. Sure, yeah. So the proponent of the local cooperative solution will evaluate their operations and suggest a year that makes the most sense to compare to. So the person who is applying or the group that's applying for the local cooperative solution and if, if I can just add on a little bit about the background for that. In the existing regulation, I believe it says 2021 or the previous year. So what we are recognizing in this case is that we will still let people use 2021 or 2020, which was the prior year in the existing regulation. Folks will also be able to compare to this year, which is a drought year with the existence of the emergency regulation. So we're proposing to allow for the same years that are in the existing regulation with the addition of 2022 in the preliminary proposed updates to the regulation. Great, thank you. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Let's move on to um, a phone caller has their hand up, um, ending in 682. So you can go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Uh, Tom Hayden, here from Scott Long. And uh, I have a question for uh, both of you that spoke, is what's the margin of error on these graphs? and suggested numbers. Okay, it was a little bit hard to hear you there. Um, it sounds like you were asking about what's the margin of error and what was that specifically about? Uh, on the graph with uh, uh, the, the number of coho coming up, the number of fish coming up, um, the margin of error, on, on all these graphs and studies that you've done. Okay. Usually when these are, when these kind of things are done, there's a margin of error that is 
um, revealed, and I just wondered if you had one. Okay, Joe, could you quickly respond to that? Yeah, Again. I would probably have to consult with our uh, technical scientists for an exact answer. Um, we, for the juvenile salmon, we do efficiency studies. And so the, um, we make estimates um, based on the efficiency studies we do. For the adult salmon, um, we do a variety of things like um, uh, carcass surveys and video weirs. And um, I feel pretty strongly um, that uh, it's uh, a close estimate, but I don't have a number for you without uh, checking in with technical staff first, uh, but I can try to generate an answer for you. Okay, so it's like you. another. Yeah, that'd be a great uh, one to email us, Tom. Yes. Can I ask another question of Joe? Is it related to the proposed updates to the emergency regulation or is it a more general yeah, question? I was, uh, I was, I'll let you decide. I was wondering those fish in the video trying to get upstream. Um, uh, how high was that waterfall that they were trying to get up and over? It seemed pretty low and I've watched a lot of fish and they go right up something like that. And it looked like they were having trouble. And I was yeah. wondering why. It's because uh, they didn't have enough of pool depth um, in front of, they need a certain amount of pool depth and velocity in front of a barrier to, to get over it. So there were several like that in that reach. And um, you're right, that's not a high, there wasn't a high jump, but you need water to get, um, for a fish to get velocity to get over it. They can't swim right up to fall. Well, they, they struggle as you saw. And in that little, and that without high, what was the height of that falls? I don't know the exact, I don't know how many inches that was. It wasn't very big. Okay, hey, let's move you. on. To, thank you so much. Again, if you have um, specific questions like this um, about uh, the in environmental situation, uh, about the science, um, as it is a little bit separate from what we're discussing today, please email those questions. They're very welcome. Um, we just want to use the space to talk directly about the proposed emergency regulation updates. Okay, so I see Craig Tucker and Betsy Stapleton both have their hands up. Um, I'm going to go ahead and allow both of you to unmute yourselves. All right, go ahead, Craig. Hey, thanks. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, the crew tribe broadly supports the regulations. And if anything, we would support them going even further. Um, we're not convinced that the flows and the regulations are truly adequate for recovery of the, of the fish or to prevent extinction of coho salmon in particular. Um, but we do appreciate all the work everybody has put into this. And just by looking at the numbers of juvenile out migrants this year, um, you know, you can make the case that these curtailments have actually been effective because we've had a pretty significant number, much larger than usual, of out migrating fish this year in both the Scott and the Shastas. So we'll be filing written comments as well, but we do appreciate all the work on this. Okay, thank you, Craig. Just as a reminder, um, and we will log um, your comment, we just are still reserving this time for just questions. Um, we will get to our comments in just a moment. Um, so Betsy, do you have a question or a comment? I have a question. Great, okay, go ahead. Um, in reading the um, regulations around the local cooperative solutions, the, it appeared to me, and um, if I'm incorrect, I'd like to get accurate information that for those who are doing a solution based on um, overlying groundwater, there's a very straightforward standard of uh, reduction of use by 30% over the selected baseline year. However, for those that are also including surface water in their local cooperative solution, there's a much higher standard that um, CDFW determines that um, the totality of beneficial actions that include potentially actions for the benefit of uh, coho equal or exceed the effect of water extraction. So I'm wondering why 
there's a differential for the standard between surface diversion uh, solutions and overlying groundwater solutions. Thanks for the question, Betsy. That's a really good question. Um, so the you are correct in the existing regulation for groundwater local cooperative solutions, the deputy director is able to um, issue those because we were able to make a finding um, that it is appropriate to do so for groundwater. Groundwater is the highest priority right, especially in the Scott where it's called out as such um, in the adjudication. Um, having people conserve water early, 30%, um, in months prior to when they are going to be curtailed helps with keeping the groundwater level higher um, and doesn't cause an injury to other legal users of water, which is one of the things we look at in approving local cooperative solutions. So there is a different criteria for groundwater than for surface water because of its priority of right. Um, and we are able to make those findings um, as part of the regulation and issue those in a different way. Uh, surface water is different and we can't do it in the same way that we are able to do it for groundwater. And if you wanna talk about that more, happy to have that discussion um, and just send us an email and we can set up a, a time to talk about it more. Thank you. Great, thank you, Erin. Um, so Nick Joslin has his hand up and he'll be our last question before we move into the public comment period. So Nick, did you have a question specific about the proposed emergency regulation updates? Hi, this is Nick Joslin, Friends of the Shasta River. I was curious how the 125 CFS rate was chosen in the Shasta for winter flows when gravel movement's already quite limited in the Shasta. You want me to do that one, Molly? So, um, the original regulation uh, was based on the 2014 Scott River flow assessment by McBain and Trush. They had a dry year and a normal or average year uh, winter flow scenario. And um, in the short amount of time that we had, we proposed the dry year scenario. Uh, in the time in between regulation adoption and um, this year, and even over the winter, we were asked to, to consider um, a, a critically dry year scenario. There's different types of water, year, there's different water year types. So um, we worked internally on um, compositing the model results and uh, uh, ran scenarios for critically dry year uh, flows in the Shasta River and uh, a range of 105 to 125 for critically dry year was kind of the range we're working with and, and to avoid superimposition. Um, we landed on those numbers. So it was, the short answer is it was running the same models we used in a critically dry year scenario. Thank you. Great, all right. So now I'm seeing no more questions in the queue. So we're going to go ahead and move into our public comment period. Um, and we'd first like to open the floor to our board members, tribal leaders, or any elected officials that are here on the call before we open it up to the broader public. All right, so if you are an elected official, a tribal leader or a board member, please raise your hand and I will allow you to unmute yourself. And it looks like first person in the queue is Sheriff Jeremiah LaRue. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Well, I appreciate uh, your time this afternoon. I just uh, have a couple things I'd like to bring up. I've had a few meetings with the water board uh, folks a couple weeks past. And one of the things that I brought up was we have a clearly identifiable waste, wasteful use of groundwater uh, going to illegal cannabis. And for example, yesterday alone, there was over 250,000 gallons that was used from one well. And I would hope that the water board would consider that significant and that it would be viewed as illegal and also a waste of precious groundwater. And I, I have some concerns that, 
I guess that uh, maybe the water board is being a little bit direct and targeting people that are um, doing legal agriculture instead of those that are handling um, or using the water for illegal purposes. And I think that if we're trying to conserve water, and that's truly what we're trying to do, that we need to look at something that's identifiable that is a waste of groundwater. And that would be in this community specifically, um, the illegal cannabis cultivation that's taking hundreds of thousands of gallons per day for illegal purposes. And so I brought this up before that we have uh, video, photographs, statements, that points directly to those that are using it for illegal purposes. And we'd like to team up to sort of work with the water board to help our community to preserve uh, that groundwater, which should be used for lawful purposes. And I just hope that the water board takes that seriously. And, um, you know, we have people that their wells are going dry and this shouldn't be against people that are using water for legitimate purposes. And so if truly conservation is the goal and we can identify a problem, we should make that the priority and not going after people that are using it for legitimate agriculture. That's all. Great, thank you for your comment. Okay, I also see Brandon Chris, the Siskiyou County Supervisor. You should get an invitation to unmute yourself. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. Thank you. Um, yes, my name is Brandon Chris, Siskiyou County Supervisor, District 1 and uh, the 2022 Chair. <clears throat> the Shasta and Scott Rivers are critical in supporting agriculture in Siskiyou County and just as imperative to Coho Chinook salmon life cycles. Uh, much attention has been focused on these rivers the last several decades regarding river conditions and corresponding salmon populations. This focus has caused conflict between irrigators who depend on water for crops and livestock and tribes who depend on a healthy fishery. Siskiyou County has continually advocated projects that would provide meaningful solutions and would serve to end this decades long conflict. Flows are of greatest concern during the late summer and fall months when adult Chinook salmon in-migrate and adult coho begin to in-migrate, both for the purpose of spawning. One of the clearest indicators of salmon populations is the number of juvenile salmonids that hatch following spawning and out-migrate river systems each year. Out-migrating numbers vary from year to year along with varying river flows. In many instances, flows have dropped below minimum curtailment orders in late summer, early fall, while the following years have produced high out-migrating numbers. For example, for 10 of the last 22 years, out-migrating juvenile Chinook exceeded 1 million salmons in the Shasta River when the prior months of July through September, when adult Chinook in migrate to spawn were below the minimum flow requirements. Additionally, during 2006, 2009, 2012, and 2022, out migrating co salmon exceeded 45,000 juveniles in the Scott River when the months of August through October were near or below minimum flow requirements. This information is presented to demonstrate that while important, River flows are not the only function of a healthy fishery, or better said, a quantity of water flowing down the river. And more importantly, that curtailment orders do little to improve fishery health and populations. Siskiyou County will be submitting written comments on the potential to capture excess river flows during the months of January through March, when the flows are most often in excess of any fishery or environmental needs. Based on data for the past 22 years, we believe there is the potential to capture an average of 23,801 acre feet from the Scott River and 9,333 acre feet from the Shasta River each winter. These estimates are very conservative and calculate capturing only 30% of excess flows for 20 days of each month. We hope this information can be utilized to fully secure support funding and necessary authorizations and permits to develop infrastructure and store excess flows. Siskiyou County is very solutions oriented. It is the county's intent 
that these flows would be fully utilized to support fisheries and other environmental needs during late summer and early fall months as needed. Two final points. First, as the chair of the Siskiyou County Flood Control and Water Conservation District, which acts as the GSA for the Shasta and Scott Basins, we continue to express our serious concern regarding the state board's overreach of authority over groundwater. The state legislature through the passage of SIGMA clearly granted groundwater management to GSAs. However, through these curtailment actions, it appears that the water board is circumventing the authorities and management responsibility granted through SIGMA to local agencies. The state board never formally or informally consulted or coordinated with the GSA uh, during the past year regarding curtailment orders and instead use the orders as a tool to assert jurisdiction over groundwater. Uh, we therefore request the state board consult with the GSA uh, regarding all curtailment proposals and actions. Secondly, and lastly, uh, there is extensive unregulated unre use of water throughout Siskiyou County for illegal cannabis grows. Uh, this unregulated, unregulated and illegal use continues to in full even in the face of curtailments as leader on legal water users. <clears throat> the state water board uh, must assist the county in addressing these illegal uses and provide any necessary resources. Um, to close, if every drop counts, then the wasted gallons on illegal usage should be a, a top priority for the state of California. Uh, we stand ready for your assistance and I uh, thank you for your time here. Great, thank you for your comment. It looks like we also have someone on the phone calling in to um, join during this preliminary comment period for elected officials and tribal leaders. All right, your phone number is ending in 081. You can press star six to unmute yourself. All right, not hearing from not this. Hearing from oh, there you, there you are. Sorry. 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 I, we just got in line for the following comment period. We're not a government. Okay, great. I'll come back to you. All right, and Brandon Fawaz. Yep, Brandon Fawaz here, can you hear me? Yes. All right, <clears throat> thank you for the time to have this meeting, although I wish we weren't having to have this meeting and I uh, point out I'm gonna speak you know, primarily as a farmer here in Scott Valley, but I'd point out that I am elected to our local city council and to a uh, school board. And so I see all aspects of how a vibrant community is needed. And when people are working, they get into less trouble. And so I'll just kind of end it at that. In dealing with the, the regulation, the local cooperative solution, I just want to reiterate how tough it is for ag. I know you hear that all the time. We, we are getting kind of pushed towards the annual rotational crops, such as grain. And, and while we're going to make it work for now, it's not something that is long-term sustainable for us. To provide a little bit of constructive um, thought looking forward, and we'd be happy probably through Jack Rice to help submit something in writing if the water board would have the appetite to hear us a little bit. We need a little bit of flexibility as an irrigator when we're coming up with a plan in January or February about what our water use could be in August or September. With having to show the monthly reductions of July, August, and September, we understand the, the, the need that those have to be the 30% reduction, um, you know, based on, on your baseline year. If there were a five or seven day flex with a small percentage of our irrigation, you know, we can't control the weather and neither can you, we all know that, but there could be situations that arise where say we, it's a, it's an early dry year and we want to use some of our water we had allocated in August in July. And that means that we'd use less water in August and then none in September. If we had that option to move some water use forward a little bit, then we could, you know, in the spirit of the regulation end up not um, irrigating as late. On the flip side, if there were an amount to move a small amount when we get weather delayed for a long time and, you know, we're going to need to use, you know, five days of July water on 
you know, water that we told you will be done using this amount on July 31st. What if it gets done on August 4th? Is that really that much of a difference? It, it could be the, a, a very large difference for us. And, uh, you know, maybe it could be, be looked at. And, you know, to, you know, kind of sum it up, I, I really look forward. We use the term local cooperative solution. And, you know, right now we're, we're all, you know, kind of having to be reactionary with the drought that's been handed towards us. But I, I would look forward to getting, you know, some people to come out and look at some real solutions that could be forward looking. I have an idea of a couple projects, you know, on our ranch and others that could really, um, I think, help going forward. But they're they're forward. They're not reactionary. And you know, right now we're really we're all kind of trying to chase our tail a little bit. And I, I hope we can get a breath from that and look forward together. And uh, thank you. All right, thank you. So now we will move into. Uh, we'll open the floor up to the general public. Um, so you'll have a three minute speaking time. Um, just a reminder, please keep your comments brief to the point, specifically about your feedback on the uh, draft updates to the emergency regulations. Um, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and go back to the phone number ending in 081 and you will have three minutes to speak. And if you could please again, introduce yourself and your affiliation. Can you hear me? Yes. This is Karen Newton. I'm a Scott Valley rancher. Uh, ranch is located in the middle of Scott Valley along the Scott River where I grew up and where my children and grandchildren are also. We submitted an LCS plan because we felt it was the only option to keep our family ranch going this year. But given the dry weather and the low snowpack this last winter, it's unlikely that any sacrifice by us is going to keep Scott River running all season. And I'm not sure how long ranchers and far ranches and farms in Scott Valley can keep operating at 70%. I think we do well to remember that the water is everything, not only to the fish, but to agriculture as well. According to the CDFW counts here in the Scott River, the threatened coho are surviving and doing well. So the ranchers and farmer in the valley need to survive and do well also. Scott Valley would be one big ugly subdivision without the farms and ranches here. Inefficient livestock watering, that's, uh, that's not my word, that's the department words. Uh, on the subject of livestock watering or winter recharge, call it what you may, by running water through earthen ditches in the seasons where there's plenty of water in the river and tributaries for the fish to survive and out migrate, is I believe one of the smartest and most efficient ways to recharge the aquifer. Water on the ground is water in the ground. Setting dates in this proposal, I think September through March 31st by the department or the CDFW to keep water out of these ditches except for minimal livestock watering makes no sense when there's enough water for both the fish and the farmers and ranchers to be using it to help fill the aquifer by running the ditches. One more note, I've been keeping track in a journal when the river stops running and when it starts, I guess reconnects is the proper term now, under the, under the bridge at our ranch for a number of years. And I also have kept track and charted the rainfall for about 20 years. The correlation between when the river starts running and the first decent mountain rains in the fall are pretty evident. I believe Scott River is Pretty solely, pretty much solely dependent on the mountain rains and the snowpack. Thank you. Great, thank you for your comment. Matt Kane, it looks like you would like to speak again. Thank you. Uh, this is Nathaniel Kane with Environmental Law Foundation. Um, last summer, we advocated for these um, emergency regs. Um, and we strongly urge the state board to renew these regs. Um, also last summer, we strongly advocated um, for these regs to go a little bit further, uh, to require more robust water use reporting for all agricultural users, to require metering of uh, agricultural wells so we know how much water is coming out. Um, and um, I, I hope that the state board will revisit some of these issues um, going forward this summer, looking at these regs again. 
Um, I, I think that the we, we, we think that the cooperative solution should be limited um, to sustaining flows in the river. We don't believe that a 30% or a 15% reduction in the Scott and the Shasta is necessarily sufficient. And I think we think that that issue should be uh, relooked at in this process. Um, as to the specific revisions in this um, in this new round of regs, um, I think some of the some of the changes are positive. Extending the stock water provision until March 31st, I think is a step in the right direction. As we saw during the dry spell this winter, uh, both the Scott and the Shasta dipped below their minimum flow uh, levels during that time. And if the stock watering um, provision had been in effect, it's possible that that wouldn't have happened. Um, likewise, I, I did like the language in the new cooperative solution language about stock watering that is very explicit about protecting uh, reds during the winter um, uh, and flows um, in the winter and tributaries, because that this is something that we've seen where tributaries especially can be dewatered in the, in the river as a result of stock watering. Um, I do want to raise some issues with uh, the new revisions. First, um, I think that deleting section 875.6 is problematic. I think that reporting is very important to lay a record of who is actually complying with this reg by ceasing diversions when directed to. And I would urge the board to put that back in. Um, and lastly, um, as I raised during the question period, I think that 875F4D4 is a bit unclear as written and could be clarified. I would suggest uh, taking a single reference here, maybe 2019, which was a wet year, and have the percent uh, reduction measured off of that. That way it's consistent. And we know that groundwater use increases in dry years. So choosing a wet year as a baseline, I think would be a more fair uh, and consistent and protective standard. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to comment. And we will put all this in written comments that will be submitted by the deadline. Thank you. Great, thank you, Nathaniel. Okay, next up, we have a phone number ending in 402. You can press star six to unmute. Hello. Hi. Hi, Warren Farnham, property owner, Scott Valley. So I'll try to be quick, roll through this three minutes thing. So um, the emergency regs are becoming very convoluted to the degree that the water board will not be able to make decisions based on factual information, but rather intrinsic value ideologies. So for example, I'm gonna focus a little bit on the inefficient stock water section. So 875.7a, um, to quote, not reasonable in the light of alternatives available and competing uses. Um, let's define what are the competing uses that will be negatively impacted and how is that demonstrated? Uh, section C as well adds to the confusion by adding unreasonably inhibit adult or juvenile salmonid migration, incubation, or rearing or unreasonably impact competing uses. I, man, I don't know how we go down that road. Uh, section D refers to even more challenging solutions by referring to 875 subdivision uh, F4B3, uh, which requires an LCS plan and determination by CDFW that inefficient livestock watering is reasonable. That's the near impossible to put into the plan and meet those undefined requirements. Section uh, A4, dealing with non-consumptive uses and how can a diverter produce the facts so they can meet the requirements under perjury that the division of water, the diversion of water will not decrease downstream flows in the river. This will make any recharge project falling under the promise of non-consumptive use under the above section 875.1A2 impossible. Um, these additional requirements are not conducive to potential solutions and factual decision-making for all parties involved. Issues in the draft raid will bring two other issues that need further determination by the water board. Uh, for one, and I heard it a little earlier that they don't want to do it, is when is the water board going to make a determination that CPs can be considered a beneficial use? The board should, for the following reasons, any recharge project in the Scott Valley would be based upon overland surface water recharge, hence CP. Two, the water, the water board is actually fast-tracking a CEQA process, and that was discussed earlier um, by Ms. Orr. And so what is the difference between a water board defined inefficient conveyance method and what is proposed in this recharge project? 
A stock water diversion in the proposed project utilize the same water above the gauging station. Both operate in the same time of the year, and both can predict recharge because of low ET, low vegetative uptake, and major diversion. Wouldn't the positive solution be to encourage livestock diversion where seepage is high and interconnected flows are being met? The diversion reporting system is already in place and no further regulatory permitting is required. Recognizing seepage and stock water diversion as beneficial will persist as a positive recharge option beyond emergency regs and an exempt CEQA project process. The acts of diverting surface water for irrigation or stock water use and incorporating seepage in groundwater plans, water balances is consistent with stigma and should be in these regs as well. Failure to recognize surface water diversion seepage as recharge as beneficial will eliminate the greatest and only efficient tool for recharge projects in Scott Valley that could help in-stream flows later in the year. Looking forward, the fish need periods of high flows. So let's focus outside the difficult drought conditions and increase the frequency of those extended flow years by creative recharge projects. Simplify this whole section or sections of these regs to allow stock water diversion if flows are being met at the gauging station and winter connectivity flush the river has occurred. Second, utilize existing weekly diversion reporting requirements to gather data that could be used for an estimated recharge for future water balance understanding. And acknowledge that if flows cannot be met at the gauging station, the divergence will cease. The draft, the draft regs, and secondly, the draft regs in section 875.3b reference article five, section 697, concerning livestock watering needs and efficiencies. This regulatory reference is for the application of water rights and is not appropriate for use as a regulatory threshold on existing water rights that are already appropriated and adjudicated by the court. Following the earlier mentioned, three recommendations for stock water diversions could eliminate the need for this section. Um, improving LCS okay, sorry, participation. Sorry to interrupt okay. here. So we're over time. Um, we're over. We, we value what you have to say. Um, and uh, there was already a request in the chat actually for um, that a staff member requested for you to please submit your comments uh, via email, just because there's a lot here. It's, a, it's difficult to transcribe over audio. So if you could please, um, we'd really, we'd really appreciate if you could email your comments and thank you so much for sharing them with us today. Okay. Okay. So thank, thank you, you so much. So we're going to move on to our next speaker, Elisa Noble. Elisa, you should get a notification and you'll have three minutes. Great, can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Um, Elisa Noble, Executive Director of the Scott Valley and Shasta Valley Water Master District. Um, many of our uh, same comments here, I'll, I'll give a brief summary and then we'll submit uh, in writing as well. As a reminder for any new folks, uh, the Water Master District has a ministerial duty to distribute water in accordance with the decreed priority of water rights. While we don't provide enforcement of the State Water Board's drought regulation, we will continue to coordinate with State Water Board staff to ensure that the decreed priority of water rights is upheld. Along that line, um, we do appreciate the provision for local cooperative solutions, but um, are having a difficult time finding out uh, ways to apply those within the priority system of adjudicated surface water rights in the Shasta Valley. Still looking for creative solutions there. Uh, also, it, it still remains unclear if how groundwater users that impact river flow will be curtailed within the drought regulations. Um, and this creates an uncertain playing field for other water users who considering a voluntary reduction. Uh, I also want to comment on the inefficient livestock watering provision. Uh, we continue to recommend that that provision be removed. If it is going to remain, um, I have similar questions as the previous speaker as to the source of those numbers. Um, of course, it's in the California code, but what is that source? Um, that that code allows for 15 gallons per head per day for all cattle. Just as an example, a lactating cow and her calf could require up to 36 gallons per day. There's an, a range of factors there, temperature, dry matter, intake, life stage, et cetera. Uh, there's good science that talks about these water demands for livestock. And uh, we encourage in 
the board to consult with the state veterinarian and establish science on what those numbers should be. Appreciate the amendments made to the flow requirements. I uh, just want to recognize the need for additional research. Uh, we're trying to help where we can as our water masters are out in the field. Um, lots of need for additional research to uh, find the biological needs and how that is. We appreciate the uh, continued presentations on what funding is available and uh, just encourage our agency folks to help identify funding to compensate water users who are curtailed and to provide financial incentives for voluntary reductions as well. Thank you for your time. Great, thank you so much, Elisa. Appreciate you staying in time here. Next up is Theodora from Scott Valley Ag Water Alliance. You have three minutes. Hi, thanks for taking uh, my comments. Yeah, from Scott Valley Agriculture Water Alliance perspective, we kind of wanted to start out just on page one of the regs and, and look at some of the assumptions made because you know we're asking for a lot from our producers. And um, I think to us, the onus is on the wildlife agencies to show us what what the needs are, the life uh, stage needs are for these species and which species in particular we're trying to help at what time of year and in what location. And if the agencies could show us exactly what and where uh, things are needed, you know, be pinpointed, we could do something helpful. But this blanket regulation on us, um, it's, it's hard to call it a solution, partly because the flow levels that we're, we're being asked to meet in the river are actually gonna be unachievable um, as on a drought year like what we had last year or recent years. And um, no, the, the Scott Valley hydro, hydrologic model developed by UC Davis shows that even 100% curtailment of, our, of all of our irrigation would not have reached, helped us reach these flow levels in these types of years. So we can't really call it a solution if we know we can't reach those levels. And furthermore, we know that in nine out of the, those, the past 11 years, we haven't met those, those flow objectives, yet we know that our co numbers, coho numbers have been pretty resilient. And um, we had near record high out migration this year. And, and that can't be credited to the curtailments from last year. Um, so we do recognize, however, that there is a fall run Chinook. Uh, there's need for some help there. And we want to find solutions to that. But these, the flow objectives don't give us those solutions. And um, it's especially tough when these regulations do blanket restrictions on winter stock water, which does have a side benefit of, as we've been mentioning, of, of recharging the aquifer. So um, that's, that would be a helpful part of a solution. And we would really appreciate it if we could get managed aquifer recharge permits through. I know that's a, that has been mentioned by the, the State Water Board and we appreciate that. And, and we think that that would be a really constructive focus. And those are the kinds of uh, kind of solutions we should be seeking, but to try to pretend like we're not going to attain these flow levels these flow objectives, it's just going to do harm to all of us, but it, and it's not really going to help anything because they're unachievable. So thanks for the opportunity. Great. Thank you, Theodora. Next up, we have Amanda Cooper from California Trout. Thank yeah. you. I will uh, keep this short. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to the State Water Board and to CDFW for their work on developing these regulations and to say that Caltrow unequivocally supports readopting these emergency regulations, um, especially given that this is an extremely dry year. And with respect to the proposed changes, we see some good things in here, but we would like to highlight our concern with reporting requirements being removed. 
We think these requirements should remain in the regulations to help ensure diverters are complying with any curtailment orders. And so thank you for providing, for providing me with the opportunity to speak here and Caltrout will be submitting written comments as well. Great, thank you so much, Amanda. Next up, we have Nick Jocelyn. Hi, Nick Jocelyn, friends of the Shasta River. First, I'd like to say thank you all for the work you've been doing to put these regs forward. I know it's been a lot of work. I'd also like to thank the water master who's been working in the Shasta with a really difficult task. I think they've been doing a good job keeping the flows um, relatively within uh, decent range. And I think the ability you're showing to um, make these adjustments to the regs shows that adaptive strategies are a good process moving forward. And I hope we can use this adaptive strategy and move towards a permanent in-stream flow recommendation for the Shasta and Scott. I really do think more gauging throughout both rivers would help. I floated the Shasta River Big Springs Ranch property today. Thank you, CDFW, for the opportunity. It's apparent there are important reaches of the Shasta that are critical to fish habitat and without ga gauging throughout the river, we are not accommodating some very important habitat <clears throat> when we only look at the mouth. Seems likely that there are other factors affecting surface water flows throughout these ungaged sections. I question uh, whether some of the new gauges be installed, be being installed by the water master could be incorporated to help adapt some of these strategies. Because um, we, and I'd also like to say we aren't accounting for the cold water that fish need. So I think temperature would be an important component going forward as well. I'd also hope that the department's 1707 water from the Big Springs Ranch could be accounted for and would be added on top of any in-stream flow recommendation. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, we'll next go to Jack Rice. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, perfect, thank you, Jack Rice working with the uh, Siskiyou County Farm Bureau. Uh, a couple of things just to reiterate statements that have been made before, but this, the drought is a real challenge. The curtailments impose real burdens on farmers throughout uh, both valleys. Um, that said, they are working to, uh, trying to find ways to adapt, uh, find solutions and in light of where we're at, I, it's important to recognize, I think that the regulations have sought to include some flexibility and the staff and the, the water board and the CDFW have worked with, uh, with landowners and others to um, utilize that. And I think that's really important. Uh, another kind of general comment to highlight is that these, the local cooperative solutions are really short-term solutions. These, these are things that people have, struggled to figure out what they can do to scrape by in a really bad year, just like the fish concerns are. And uh, it's not a long-term solution, but it's something that people are trying to find ways to, to deal with. Comments specifically to the regs, although not to specific language, um, there's already provisions in there about inefficient livestock watering and when those can be lifted and it was pointed out they were lifted uh, early in the Shasta, and that's an important feature because these are this an important water right, and the use is essential. So look forward to continuing attention to that uh, opportunity when they come up. Temporary recharge permits. That's a, a lot of the concern. Appreciated that information and uh, the idea of when those need to be developed. This is key for groundwater sustainability, and particularly in Scott Valley, but in both basins. And while there may be some uncertainty about the specific results of any particular recharge, the general principles and the effects are pretty well understood and incorporated in the GSP. And I think the groundwater sustainability plan, the models show that. So we really encourage uh, the agencies, the water board and CDFW 
and the Groundwater Sustainability Agency to work with landowners on figuring out how to do this well. Also, uh, regarding flows, people are the community still working to understand the flows and the balance between the fish and irrigator use. And as we get more information, we look forward to continuing to talk and see if there's opportunities for that balance to be refined as we go forward. Thank you very much. And we'll be submitting written comments as well. Thank you so much. David Webb, you will be next. Thank you very much. This is David Webb speaking as a member of the Friends of the Shasta River. I also want to thank both all of you, staff members, and the board itself for staying the course on this very difficult topic where there's a lot of pressure to abandon protection of public trust resources. And I also want to thank the Department of Fish and Wildlife for stepping up and doing a great job of presenting the whys and the hows and the what's needed uh, to, to get us through this drought event. Um, we support the continued adoption of the curtailment. And I think it's a significant step in the right direction, both in drought years and in normal years, where in the past, there was no such protection in place and needed to be. But we don't support reductions in reporting requirements. We think better reporting is going to be essential to long-term planning, to doing a better job in the future, and there's always room for a better job. And without, without detailed reporting, we're not going to have that opportunity. I'd also like to point out that as far as reporting goes in normal years, reporting for diverters under the water master is grossly inadequate for planning purposes. Their data is aggregated into a reach by reach or tributary by tributary number. And that alone is almost useless in terms of planning. So I would really like to suggest that you look beyond just the drought in terms of reporting and improve reporting requirements under water masters. I worked for 25 years trying to, to support and encourage people to take the cooperative approach to finding ways to minimize negative impacts on public trust resources. Among the things that didn't sell well, in fact, hardly sold at all, were alternative stock water systems. People, it's human nature, I think, to avoid doing things if they can be avoided. And those are one of the things that were avoided. And now we're coming to, well, maybe there was a reason why they needed to be done. And I think we need to stay the course on the requirements for tightening up stock water use, which is not well planned in terms of recharge and horribly inefficient in terms of providing livestock with the water they need. We can do a lot better than we have. In the past, there was no compelling incentive to do so. Keep those incentives in place. And I think we will see some changes. So thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to comment and we'll be working on written comments also. Great, thank you, David. All right, so it looks like our last hand up today is going to be Sari Summerstrom. Hello, thank you. My name is Sari Summerstrom. I'm a retired watershed consultant in Scott Valley. I'm so sorry, Sari. Can you unmute yourself again? Okay. There we can I, there, can now we can hear you. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, this is Sari Sommerstrom. I'm a retired watershed consultant from Scott Valley, working here since 1989 on trying to get habitat issues addressed here. Um, I'd like to start with the Chinook assumption. Back in the early 90s, there were low flow years also, and the Chinook adults had trouble getting into the valley. As a result, um, the Scott Valley Crimp Group in 1995 came up with a fall flows action plan, and we were definitely targeting how to get those Chinook up in these drought years. Um, and we started getting some good progress on that. However, all of a sudden, the coho got listed in 97 by the feds under ESA, and then in um, by 05 by the state, all of a sudden money for grants and everything shifted, not for, for Chinook, but only get money for coho. You know, tension shifted. So we did, and I think that's showing that we have done pretty well on the coho because we have targeted that, but we have not been able to target the Chinook for lots of reasons. Um, and so on the Chinook numbers, I know there's great concern about 
commercial fishermen on the coast and the tribes for not being able to get their um, allocation uh, due to the low numbers. And we are very sympathetic to that too, because their livelihoods are also at risk. But to meet that minimum escapement of 40,700 Chinook in the Klamath, um, there's still 15,000 fish short of meeting that for the last three years. The Scott is about 4,000 fish short of its average, as Joe pointed out. Ideally, we should have 5,000 and we're yeah, about 1,300 to 1,800. So even if we may, uh, met our average, we're not going to be able to help the Klamath. In, in, we're not the magic bullet for the Klamath um, fishery allocation. Uh, there are other issues that have to be addressed on the Chinook. For COHO, the 2013 COHO um, problem, I was intimately involved with that, with the water trust, trying to seek every drop of water we could because those COHO were able to get up into the main stem at 60 CFS, which is your target flow, your minimum flow, but the tribs were not flowing. We did not have the rain. And then when we did get precipitation, it was snow and ice, and they could not get up to their natal stream. So um, um, and again, there's not a magic flow target on the main stem for, to help the coho. So I, I think when we're talking about realistic solutions, we really do need to look at numbers and how much can be done. Um, a burden of proof, I think, the LCS livestock option that's being offered here is helpful at one level, um, but working on burden on that, the data that is necessary to prove you're not having an impact, that's a huge amount of data that is not always available. Again, trying to get the funding to do the, those data collections. Um, I'd like to have the fish agencies share that burden of proof and not put it on the landowner, the water user for doing that. Um, and my last point is your process. Your process needs to be rethought. Doing these we're addendum 26 on the Scott for a temporary extension of conditional suspension of the curtailment, it really is, is getting pretty ridiculous. And it's, it's burdensome. It's, not, it's taking away the importance of what you're trying to establish here on alerting people to the flow. Uh, please, let's reconsider how you communicate the need for um, curtailment. This is not the way to do it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sari. We have two more hands up here for folks who would like to speak. All right. So the phone number ending in 682. Uh, Tom Hayden here. Hey, Am I getting through? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, I can, um, just a little history on our valley here. Uh, back in 1955, we started the flood season and we had a horrific flood then. Um, 64 followed with another flood as well as 74 and a small one in 84. This caused a lot of erosion on the riverbanks and uh, destruction um, of all of these floods filled a lot of our, uh, what we call uh, ponds, low grounds and sloughs with uh, sand and debris. And so we lost a lot of our pools of water that helped um, uh, recharge our aquifer level. And so we started a, a restoration program on the river, which worked really nice. I think we're seeing some great results of it through the years. But is, is what has happened, in my opinion, that we've made the river a flume. And so we have nothing to hold that water back into our valley to seep into our aquifer level. And I think in looking for solutions to slow that water down, make it deeper um, for fish to come up and, and that may solve the stock water issue, uh, not only on the river, but it's tributaries. Our um, tributaries that, that feed the river come off the west side and the southern end of the valley and 
also if we can also find a way to check these tributaries to hold water, slow it down, uh, keep it cooler in the in the hotter months. Um, I think this would be a great um, benefit. And once we fill our aquifer level, uh, which is going to take some time, I think our containment will be nil or um, not necessary for such a long period of time. Um, I do believe, and I know this is a bad situation, but in checking our river to make some sort of method to hold the water back in the in the non-use time, and it will create uh, coolness of the water and uh, oxygen for the fish to breathe and be health, healthier and will give them fish a good run to get over these checks. Uh, I think they can be designed to, so that the fish can come up the river. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much. Looks like we have one hand up, ending in 895. And you can press star six to unmute yourself. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, my name is Cricket Martin. I'm also a member of the Scott Valley Agriculture Water Alliance. Uh, my family and I own and operate um, our family's third generation dairy. In 2016, we converted the operation to organic. As members of the Scott Valley Agriculture Water Alliance, we feel that it's important to share who we are and what could happen to our family business because of these water curtailments. Um, part of organic dairy requirements in California are that the cattle must graze at least 30% of their total feed. This requirement is becoming increasingly difficult to meet between California's drought and the 30% water curtailment being imposed. With reduced acreage to graze our cattle on, inability to grow enough of our own cattle feed, and rising feed costs due to limited availability from the drought and water curtailment, it's a strong possibility that after this year we will need to downsize our dairy herd to be able to accommodate the curtailments without also compromising the well being of our herd and falling short of our requirements. The company that we sell our organic milk to is called Organic West. Uh, we're smaller. We are a smaller dairy in the company currently, but one of the original nine who started with them when they opened up our operation and one other dairy here in Scott Valley also um, are roughly 25 miles off of Interstate 5, making it a hardship already for the milk transportation trucks to reach us. Um, if we have to downsize our herd, um, anything from what it is now, we're posing a strong likelihood of being dropped from the company and we will likely go out of business. With this 30% curtailment and another year's worth of it, we will likely have to reduce our operation size, potentially lose our milk contract, and our third generation dairy will be forced to go out of business. Please consider the livelihoods of careers, livelihoods and careers of generations of farmers and ranchers that this curtailment could and will put out of business if this continues. Thank you for listening. All right, so I'm not seeing any additional speakers in the queue here. So I believe we can go ahead and wrap it up. We're right on time, actually just a couple minutes early. So do state board folks wanna come back on at all? I'm just gonna put up our slides again. Hey Molly, thank you for facilitating today. Um, I do want to just take the opportunity to thank all of those who attended today and really encourage folks to submit their written comments as well um, by, the, by the deadline next Tuesday so that we can consider all of those as we look at potential updates to bring before the board on June 21st. Um, this webpage right here has a ton of information. This will be posted on the drought website, so you don't have to copy it all down now. Um, you can find it on the website likely later this week. 
Um, and Molly just put that in the chat for folks if they want to cut and paste it for their reference. Um, but it will be up there um, under our, our outreach flag. So I'm going to probably turn it back to Molly unless there's another slide she wants me to cover. Um, oh, I think that's it. Okay. Um, otherwise, I just want to say thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, and please, please do send your comments along. Right, and just as a reminder, the deadline for comments to be submitted is next Tuesday, the 31st uh, by 5 p.m. So please make sure you get your comments in before then. And again, thank you so much to everyone who is here, present and participating today. Uh, we really value your input and appreciate you being here with us. All right, and with that, we'll wish you a great afternoon and talk to you next time.